welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend or give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. Also, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, not much news news to tell you guys. Um, I spent a week recovering from the cold that truncated last week's intro. Um, it was exacerbated by my having to make a day trip down to Silver Spring, Maryland and back for an FDA meeting last Tuesday. Um, that was about 12 hours of transit and meetings, and I was not in great shape afterwards. But the upside of this was on the southbound train, um, I met Lewis Black, the comedian and commentator and, um, and very smart man. So uh, I introduced myself, pitched him on the podcast, told him I'd like to talk about his literary and theater writing background, um, and that I was sort of bummed when Mark Marin interviewed him and didn't spend much time on that part of, of uh, Black's career when they were on the WTF show. Um, he was seemingly pretty receptive to the idea, so we'll see if that bears fruit. I will note, for the record... I did not have any of my podcast postcards on hand. After all, I was just making a day trip to FDA, and what were the odds I would see anyone I needed to give a postcard to? Longtime listeners will recall this last bit me on the ass at the end of 2017, uh, when I had a one-day business trip up to Ottawa, where I bumped into Graydon Carter in the Ottawa airport. Um, I have subsequently asked my wife to browbeat me into making sure I have a couple of postcards with me any and all trips. Which is not to say there are not places that I should not be pitching the podcast. Um, for example, this week's guest. I met this week's guest at the memorial service for the poet Sandy McClatchy in May of 2018. Um, I recorded a podcast literally an hour or so before Sandy's memorial service, which meant I was carrying my recording gear with me to the event. But I made a vow to myself not to pitch anyone on the podcast during that evening. Um, even if they asked about the weird leather case I was carrying, filled with microphones, recording equipment, cables, etc. Now, that may sound obvious to you, but it can be very difficult for me not to do that, since the only reason I was there was that I had met Sandy through the podcast, and the organizer of the event was another past guest. Um, and just about any conversation I'd have had would somehow include the fact that I only met Sandy once when we recorded a show. Um, plus, to some extent, the podcast is the only interesting thing in my life, or so I like to believe. But... I manage not to pitch anyone, even when I met person after person after person I'd love to record with. Which brings us to this week's guest, Edmund White. Ed, as he signed his emails, and as I'll try to call him here, because Edmund sounds kind of um, formal, Ed was one of the speakers at Sandy's Memorial, and he gave this lovely speech about his friend. And during the reception afterwards, he was 
well, he's on a cane. The reception area was really overheated and warm, and he clearly needed a place to sit down. Um, so I, I grabbed a chair from a nearby table and, and gave it to the person who was with him, and he was all set. Once he was seated, I thanked him for basically just giving such a nice speech earlier. Did not introduce myself, didn't say a word, didn't stand there with a big leather case with a bunch of microphones in it. I headed back to my pal who was also there. She was going through her own agonies because she desperately wanted to introduce herself to another guest, but knew it would be gauche. So the two of us were able to kind of sublimate that all evening. In November, about six months had gone by. I figured enough time had passed, and I, I wrote Ed to invite him onto the show and mentioned the um, brief meeting at, at Sandy's Memorial. He was happy to oblige. Um, he has a new book out, a wonderful new memoir called The Unpunished Vice, uh, which is, had just come out recently from Bloomsbury, USA. Hoped we could talk about that, and, um, and here we are. The Unpunished Vice, I should say, is a memoir centered around Ed's reading life. And for me, it's an absolute joy. Um, in our conversation, Edmund described, or Ed describes himself as a culture vulture. And, and that's right up my alley. Um, the Unpunished Vice goes into not just what he was reading at different points in his life and why, but who he was in those moments and how the books aren't just companions at the time, but touchstones of his progression through life, um, which is sort of a long act of becoming as a writer, as a blurb slut for gay literature, and as a lot of other things. Um, the books are there and are sort of measuring Edmund White and becoming the measure of him. Does that make sense? The book... Well, it's of a piece with some of Ed's other memoirs, and some of the stories kind of intersect with his more chronologically oriented writing. Um, but this book has the perspective of a different man than the one who wrote some of his earlier memoirs, namely one who survived heart surgery a couple of years ago and had to reassess what reading means to him because he lost all desire to read in the wake of this surgery. It sort of reminds me a little of when I recorded with Alberto Manguel last year, and he had the experience of a sudden hospitalization where he had time to ask his partner to bring one book so that he could have something to read for the next couple of weeks of recuperation. Um, this is sort of the flip side of that. But as is my want, um, I did a crash course in Ed's writing before we got together. Um, and what's weird is I enjoyed the experience so much that I've continued to pick up more books of his to read in the months ahead. I don't do that normally. I don't have time, typically. Um, I read, I try to get in as much as I can before I sit down with the, the, the guest. And generally, you know, it's great. It gives me a, a good foundation of their work, but I have to move on. Uh, in the case of Edmund White, I plan on spending a lot of time with his work in future. Now, I can recommend the heck out of uh, The Unpunished Vice, uh, City Boy, A Boy's Own Story, Arts and Letters, his short bio of Proust, and My Lives, which I subsequently started, but when we talk about it during the episode, I hadn't yet. I have not checked out his big biography of Jean Genet, uh, nor his non-auto fiction, the more imaginative novels of his, but I'm guessing they're just as good and just as, as culturally infused, I guess, which is what appeals to me about his, his writing. Um, Edmund White has had a, a pretty wondrous life over nearly 80 years, uh, from the Midwest in 1940s and 50s to New York in the 60s and 70s, and then Paris and Rome and, and coming out as gay in a time that was much less gay friendly than today. Although he disputes that today is that much better for gays. And what with him having firsthand experience with this and my not, I'm going to take his word for it, um, his living with HIV for 30 plus years and what that, what that did to him, what that did to his writing. Um, he's, he's had quite a life and has created quite a body of work. And I'm just glad he was willing to make some time to talk. Um, we actually went on a lot longer than what's in this episode. Um, 
I had the recorder going, but said, don't worry, we'll take this part out. We went on for another 30 or 40 minutes from there. Um, just two very catty, bitchy readers going on quite a while. Um, you were never going to hear that, but that was a lot of fun. Anyway, the moral is, it is not always appropriate to introduce yourself to someone whose work you like, especially if you're at someone else's memorial service, but you should try to follow up within six months of said opportunity. Does that make sense? Anyway, caveats, New York City noise. Also, Edmund moved off the mic a little, so his voice gets a bit faint at times. I've, I've tried to level that out. Here's Ed's bio. There's a more extensive one at his website, edmundwhite.com. Edmund White is the author of many novels, including A Boy's Own Story, The Beautiful Room is Empty, The Farewell Symphony, and Our Young Man. His nonfiction includes City Boy, Inside a Pearl, and other memoirs, The Flaneur, about Paris, and literary biographies and essays, including Genet, a biography, and Proust, a life. He was named winner of the 2018 Penn Saul Bellow Award for Achievement in American Fiction. He lives in New York. His most recent book is The Unpunished Vice, A Life of Reading. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Edmund White. Who's the implied reader? Which comes up in The Unpunished Vice. Yes, uh... Well, I used to think of the implied reader as Mrs. Nabokov, yeah, uh, or Nabokov, however you say it. But uh, because I wanted to have, I mean, I knew that she in fact read my work, and I wanted someone who knew English perfectly well, but wasn't American, and wasn't a gay man, and so this was like a series of screening devices to make sure that I wasn't just preaching to the converted. Yeah. And, uh, but then later in the uh, 80s, when I lived in Paris and discovered I was positive with HIV, and, uh, and I felt I didn't know, uh, there wasn't any support group at that time. And so I began to think of myself as, writing for other gay men of my generation, my Americans. So I sort of shifted. Mm -hmm. And who is it now? Or is there a, an implied reader? I don't know. I mean, I guess I imagine, I mean, the late Sandy McClatchy certainly was always one of my favorite readers. And uh, I think that... Uh, Caroline Weber, for instance, who wrote Proust Duchess, um, is somebody I've only interviewed once uh, on stage, but I adored her and I adored her book, and and I keep thinking she would get all my references because I'm writing about a, a, a novel about uh, two Texas girls who grow, grow up oil rich in the 50s, and one becomes a French baroness, and the other one becomes a nun in South America. And yeah. uh, so I uh, am, you know, reading an awful lot about uh, French aristocrats. And Caroline Weber, who I selected as for my book of the year the, for TLS this year, and, I mean, her huge book on Proust Duchess is a miracle of research. And she is herself a French aristocrat, and I keep thinking she'd get all my jokes. So, <laughs> so it's good to have somebody in mind who's yeah, actually... Yeah, all right. Have you sent her any bits no. and pieces? Okay. okay. One of the things I, I... Well, that strikes me in the amount of reading that I did of your work, which isn't complete, uh, leading up to this, because I actually have more of your books coming afterwards, which I never do with a guest, but oh, I've, wow. I've enjoyed this uh, prep period so much, I actually need to keep extending it your fiction versus memoir versus essay versus bio or biography um and i know your fiction bifurcates between the autobiographical and the yeah. we'll say purely imaginative yeah um i would say how do you well how do you approach them or how does it um uh, particularly with the autobiography fiction versus memoir you know how do you contrast those and approach them 
Well, with a memoir, you, I, my theory is you have to be 100% honest mm -hmm. and stick to the truth, and as best you recall it. And uh, whereas autobiographical fiction, uh, you're free to rearrange. Uh, if you had five lovers, you can make that into one. And if you if it happened over a ten year period, you can make it a one month period. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in other words, you're calling it a novel, and so you're free to invent. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that uh, I hate the phrase creative nonfiction, which always sounds to me like lying. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I I think that uh, y you know that I think that especially if you have a sort of vulnerable audience the way let's say the the people in recovery who are reading uh, a million little pieces or even let's say gay people 20 years ago when i was writing at full steam uh that y you don't want to uh be caught out lying in, in what calls itself autobiography mm -hmm. yeah i think with clive james he refers to them as the unreliable memoirs for that that re or, yeah, unreliable memoir for that reason. Just eh, take it for what it's worth. You know, it's not 100% accurate, but yeah. I'll tweak some names and that'll make it, you know, <laughs> fictional enough. How has writing changed for you? You mentioned not being at full steam anymore and you've had health issues over the years. But yeah, I'm writing slower, uh, yeah. but uh, but still, I, I, I started this book a year ago and I'm on page 240, so I'm uh, doing all right, I guess. Uh, Is any writing routine or practice when you're in the middle of this? Well, uh, I used to always, I mean, everything I wrote, I wrote by hand. And then it was very laborious because I would have to dictate it to a typist. And, uh, but now I'm writing directly on the computer, which is brand new for me, which uh, I think make, makes you write uh, shorter subject verb object sentences. And, uh, and allows you to do a lot of dialogue or encourages you to do a lot of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Is this something you wish you'd had earlier, that you'd used earlier? No. Uh, I, no, because I um, I was, I always subscribe to Nabokov's theory that in, let's say, the first 50 pages of a novel, you shouldn't have too much dialogue because everybody sounds the same. Uh, and if you do kitchen, uh, kitchen cup realism... Uh, and people do almost always do realistic dialogue, no matter how extreme uh, the style might be in avant-garde. Otherwise, the dialogue tends to be naturalistic. And I think um, if you have, Nabokov said, if you have too much dialogue, uh, naturalistic dialogue, at the beginning, you've sort of handed the book over to the characters, and they all sound alike. And you've lost the control of the book. He did have a sort of puppet master approach to character, right? In terms of, you know, the characters are subordinate. He, as I recall, never had the, or professed never to have the characters take over and, and you know, lead you on their own path. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I think that's true. Um, although, you know, great characters like Humbert Humbert uh, certainly are multifaceted and you can feel sympathy for him or you can despise him. Yeah, but it's still you know, within Nabokov's control. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, do you find yourself rereading mostly or do you do you still discover new work? Oh, no, I'm, I'm on a committee for two... Uh, oh, so you're compulsorily reading new yeah, books. Yeah, <laughs> new books all the time. <laughs> Given your druthers, would you... No, I would read new things. I, I, I Almost every gay literary book in the world gets sent to me and uh, wanting a blurb and um i apologize for 20 years ago not sending you um in addition to the madman that that samuel delaney book i reissued we also did his letters from 1984 which were that same era and some of those themes get picked up in the madman had i known you know i, I would have sent those along <laughs> to you too but <laughs> i admire him so much yeah he's um He's the first real writer I'd ever met, and I think the first genius genius in terms of I know it's an overused term now, but but range and productivity and and, and seeing the world differently than the rest of us yeah. do. Um, yeah, which, he's great. Yeah, yeah, he's he's something. Um, 
on your extensive shelves here, there is um, understanding Edmund White. Oh, yeah. Did that help you understand Edmund White, seeing somebody else's critical analyses of your work over the years? I tend not to read those books no. uh, um, because, you know, uh, I once, uh, you know, I wrote the biography of Jean Genet and, uh, and Genet, uh, a, a, um, an Austrian journalist in the early 80s, asked Genet why he didn't, didn't reread his fiction, his own f five novels. And he said, I don't want to resemble myself, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty brilliant. And uh, and I, I don't like to read my own work uh, or books about me. And I think it allows me to maybe keep the the necessary humility to actually write. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, you don't want to get a swelled head. And, and of course, books like Understanding Edmund White would... Ten, I mean, it's a, a very fine book, and I, I... So you've heard? Yeah. Yeah, I've, so I've heard. <laughs> yeah, again, if somebody had produced Understanding Gil Roth, I'd be very, very concerned, but you know, <laughs> somebody else had done a better job than I had, but, you know. Um, although along those lines, and this is the big meta question, I guess, what does, what does having a bookshelf of books by Edmund White mean to you? What does stature or, or reputation mean and what did it mean when you were trying to build that versus where you are now well i've always felt like our culture or maybe all cultures uh um try to exclude people too long and uh and then they honor you too much i mean so you're either uh getting nothing uh at the whole beginning of your career or you're getting too much i mean i think like um that I I think I wrote five novels before I got one accepted, and uh, and I don't I, it was only blind stupidity that made me keep going, I mean with no encouragement, <laughs> and uh, but 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 then when I started getting published, I, and then now I, I mean I I'll win something like the the Penn Bellow Award. Yeah, you know, which is a nice one. And um, and you think, well, there are dozens of other people who could have won that. Yeah. Did reputation, did it seem satisfying as you started to, to build a career? Or was the position of, you know, the gay literature and the potential ghetto of that somehow... Well, you're always an outsider and a misfit, I guess, is the other uh, question. <laughs> well, I mean, I I don't know. I, I always thought it was peculiar to gay writers that nobody really knew who they were unless they were gay. But uh, I, I read a thing recently where Martin Amos was sitting on a plane and and uh, the his seat partner asked him what he did, and he said he was a novelist. And she said, uh, should I have heard of you? And he said, only if you're cultured. <laughs> but it made me realize that uh, that um, every, all writers are virtually unknown to 99% of the population. That is a peril when people ask me about this podcast. I try and, have you interviewed anyone I know? I, I usually can tailor it. If I, or if I say the train spotting guy, at least that, that gives a little mm -hmm, something. Mm -hmm. But if I said Irvin Welsh, they would just stare at me blankly for the most part. So. Exactly. Yeah, you know, we're a rarefied crew, apparently. Yeah, but, apparently. You know, in college, you, you studied Chinese, right? In another, you know, sort of regret question, do you wish you'd, you'd focus on literature or creative writing at no, the time, or no. would it have helped in that era? Or, no, or I mean, I, uh, I think I was... The first real artists I knew were abstract expressionist painters, and... Um, I was engaged to this woman. I just got a new photo of her. Oh, I see. Marilyn Shaver. Yeah. And uh, well, she's not, her painting there is an abstract, but yeah. she was basically an abstraction. And anyway, they uh, were very suspicious of any, any intellectualizing of their work mm -hmm. or uh, because they wanted to remain instinctual. And I think I, I grew up absorbing those prejudices so, for instance, um, 
I did take two creative writing courses in college, uh, but I don't think they were very useful. Yeah. Uh, from the illustrators and artists that I know, some of whom who didn't go to art school lament that it would have maybe given them more connection than well, skills. Possible, but, yeah. you know, again, I have no idea in that era. I, but I won prizes in creative writing at uh, University of Michigan. And uh, there was a guy called Avery Hopwood who started the Hopwood mm -hmm. Awards, which are, are quite well financed. And, uh, and they're even the winner's names are published in the New York Times. So that's how I got an agent and when I was still in college and for a play that won and I got the play produced off Broadway and so on. Oh yeah, the the story in uh, uh City Boy. Or you may have told it elsewhere also, but but you know. I don't know. Yeah, do you keep track of your own uh, what anecdotes you tell and which no, books? Okay. No. Or not in life either. <laughs> good, good. People are always saying to me, uh Oh, yeah, I know that story. I've read that book. and I, oh, oh, Okay, maybe you did. <laughs> I yeah. told that? I... <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you mentioned the teaching not being, uh, uh, or at least the classes not being worthwhile. What did you learn from teaching, which you did for decades? Well, I think that um, I, I learned uh, <laughs> to avoid avant-garde techniques. <laughs> I mean, my first two novels had been what people might call experimental, uh, forgetting Elena and Nocturnes for the King of Naples. And I I think I was, I got so impatient with that kind of writing with my students that it, it, it made me think, don't play tricks with the chronology. Start at the beginning and go to the end. And uh, don't play tricks with point of view. Just have one or two points of view and uh in other words most of the kind of modernist devices i i got pretty impatient with and i felt they'd already been fruitfully explored by other people mm -hmm. earlier in the 20th century and uh so that was one thing i learned another thing i learned is that there's usually quite a consensus about what's wrong with the story and what's right about it that in other words because I was a teacher, I didn't want to prejudice people with my opinion spoken first. So I'd always speak last. But I would pretty much agree with what the students would say were strong points and weak points in a story. So I, th I felt like there really is a, an ideal reader, if you want, or, a, or, or some sort of consensus, of a, at least in a given period in a given culture. But I mean, like other cultures love uh, allegory, and mm -hmm. we hate it. And uh, so that uh, I admit that there are differences in taste between periods. But uh, but within a period and within a culture, there tends to be a remarkable consensus, and I I think that's interesting. Uh, what else did I learn? I well, I worked my first job in. New York was working for Time Live Books, and uh, and there we constantly there were more chiefs than Indians, so we would have to uh, always rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. So I learned two things there. One was to not be word proud, and the other thing was to um, be quick, and uh, and the third thing was uh, <laughs> I thought there were only two things. But the third thing was to uh, not hype things too much because that's all that Time Lifestyle did was to the best, the most, the, the first, the so yeah. on. And so I, I learned to be very irritated with that and to uh, try to write more concretely about things and not in terms of of um, superlatives. And that was my 20 years as a trade magazine editor uh, business to business magazine. The number one thing we had was just get rid of the adjectives. Yeah. It's not the leading provider of X. It's the provider of X. Just you know, let let it go, exactly. uh, and that permeated into my personal writing to the point at which I became incredibly laconic and noun verb, and uh, <laughs> realized I had no real flair once I got rid of the adjectives and everything else. So I had oh. to, to I had to start trying to rebuild. But you know, Good. it became easier to do this and and pretend this is an art of a kind. Actually. What did you learn from interviewing? Um, to shut up. 
because oh, you're telling me to show. I'm just kidding. no, Go no, on. no. <laughs> Please don't. I'm kidding, kidding. Kidding. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think the main thing I learned was to let other people talk. I think uh, oftentimes I would interview people who were uh, more gifted or more famous or more something than me, and so I would try to. I could hear myself kind of wheedling on, trying to establish myself in the eyes of the interviewee. And I found that so impossible. And after listening to a little bit of that, I thought, oh, shut up. <laughs> I would talk to myself and I'd shut up. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, I, I was doing, a, most of my interviewing was either connected with journalism or on a variety of topics, um, or, or it was to do with the Genet biography which took me seven years to research and and I interviewed hundreds of people and uh, so I think that uh, you know that I guess I'm, I mean French people are very reluctant to speak and you do have to kind of encourage them I always say they're like the Japanese you have to know a third person to introduce you mm -hmm. and so on but um but Americans just blab right off, and uh, and so if you're interviewing a Black Panther, say, which I had to do, uh, because you know he was a friend of the Panthers, um, they'll tell you everything, and you don't need to prime them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what drew you to Janae? I mean, I know the there's the gay literature thing, but on top of that, what, what drew me to Janae? Yeah. Oh, um, well, my favorite editor. Uh, called me like in 1987 and he said uh, do you know anybody who would write a biography of Genet and I said you mean to say there isn't one already he said not really I mean there's Sartre's book but it only has about 30 pages of actual biographical <laughs> material yeah. the rest is a psychoanalysis of the writer and uh, so I said well I'll do it I blithely and I thought it would take two or three years, you know. I had no idea what I was getting into. And that was your first full-length bio, right? Yeah, it was yeah. the only one. Uh, yeah, that's where you did the short ones for, yeah. for Bruce and Rambo. Yeah. Right. Well, that actually raises the question, as long as we ask, what have you learned from X, Y, and Z? What did you learn about biography and research beyond the interviewing side of things? What um, did you go in thinking you knew and discovered, holy crap, I had no idea how you do this? Oh yeah. Well, I uh, I guess um, I mean it, it, that was a problem of, of who was the ideal reader because I would sometimes say things that were too obvious for French readers, but they were necessary for American readers, mm -hmm. and and I got not. I mean, the, basically, the book was very well received in France and in America, and I won the. National Book Critics Circle Award for that. But, uh, but basically for the research uh, is what they said uh, in the citation. But um, Was that backhanded? No. Okay, I, mean, I wasn't sure if you meant that in a, you know, not well, the writing I mean, but the research. The, or, the research was monumental because yeah. most writers are middle class. The, they come from a, a, an artistic leaning family and their mothers save all their juvenilia, and they write endless letters to other writers, and they uh, and they become celebrated fairly young. So they they're always mentioned in papers or newspapers or whatever. So uh, Genet was an orphan who was a a, a child of the assistance publique, raised in the, the most remote part of France. Uh, a juvenile delinquent from age 13 on, he hated the idea of biography because he was writing a competing version in, in his novels, which were autofiction of some sort. And I'm mean, like Thieves' Journal. It isn't really a journal. Yeah. I mean, he'll say, I spent two years in Spain, and he only spent two months. But I try to say in my biography that Two months at the height of the depression, when you're 
fighting every day to get an onion to eat for dinner must have felt like to you. Yeah. And anyway, so uh, I guess... Uh, Trying to write the biography of a man who didn't want to exist. He didn't want it. And yeah. his very good friends uh, all knew that. And and uh, the, his friends, if they were very loyal to him, knew that he didn't want anybody to speak to a biographer. And the the other thing was that he had deserted and abandoned all of his friends. So I was always dealing with wounded people. And um, I guess the flip side there is they would want to talk because they'd want to stick really. it to him. Oh, okay. I thought maybe they'd want to shiv him after the, the fact. No, but, no, no. Yeah. Uh, French people are human, so of course they gossip. But they have a very low uh, esteem for gossip. I mean, like, if you're at a French party and you tell an anecdote, a juicy anecdote about somebody whom everyone knows, they'll say, what are you, a concierge? Why, you know, you, you know, in yeah. England you can say, let's have a knees up and let's, uh, mm. we, we really should have a, a good gossip. Yeah. You can't say that in France. <laughs> you have to pretend that you're, in fact, you can't even say you're writing a biography. You have to say you're writing a study. Ah, okay. And so you figured out all the tricks and, and yeah, yeah. Now, were you already living in France yes. when that came about? Okay. Yes. Well, would it have been remotely feasible if you'd been living in New York at the time, or would you essentially have had to immerse yourself in a... Oh, I would have had to be over there. I mean, uh, like I interviewed Genet's godmother, who was 101, <coughs> and who didn't speak French, but the dialect of the Morvan. And so her granddaughter had to translate into French for me. Yeah. And um, I interviewed a woman who had um, helped him prepare um, the screens, the play of the screens. And uh, she wouldn't see me. And so I had to hire an American girl who already spoke perfectly good French to pretend to take French lessons from her for a year, <laughs> which I paid, paid for, and, and in order to introduce the worm into the apple, me. Yeah. And, uh, and then that woman became overly fond of me and, and uh, showed me x-rays of Genet's kidneys and stuff like that. <laughs> for the illustrated edition, that's, that's yeah, good right, too. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Are there any other long form bios you'd be interested? I, I mean, it, in a perfect world, you know, who would you do a? a I, I a uh, for book? a while I thought I would like to do Baudelaire, but there are already good books on him. Yeah, it's part of what inspired me to reach out to you was uh, Mark Derry's biography of Edward Gorey that that just oh, came out. Wow. I was reading that one, and you came up a few times, and I thought. You know, I, oh, am I mentioning that? Yeah, I said, I really should. And Mark actually sends his regards. Mm. But it had the same thing. Um, there's no biography of Edward Gorey yet. Didn't realize. Yeah. I just assumed that somebody had, had tackled that already. Um, but you enjoy biography along those lines? No. As a, I was wondering, as a, not just the research well, side, but... I like uh, I liked writing short uh yeah. Those two short biographies, because they were short and I didn't have to do any research. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but um, but really, it's memoir and fiction as the... Yeah. But to me, the, the difference between autofiction and imaginative fiction yeah. it is almost like two different genres. Yeah. yeah. Because one is, the, the first one, uh, autofiction is easy for me to write, because I just remember what happened. And... Uh, and then how it should have happened. That's, yeah, you know. well, maybe. And but the second kind, uh, uh, I have to lie around and think it up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Flaubert called it the marinade, the mar where you just lie on your couch and you just dream up the plot. Writer working. That's yeah, that's right. you know just staring out a window at a, a desk and yeah. Yeah, you know. I mean, it, it 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 doesn't come to you naturally. I mean. At least not to me. I suppose it would do Dickens or Balzac or, or uh, Joyce Carol's, but but um, to me, it, it's quite laborious trying to think of what should happen next. 
What prompted it, though? I mean, what prompted the most recent one? Was it did the idea germinate in that way, or? Well, I think it came partly because I, th- I was going to write about uh, a friend of mine, who who died, who's a, uh, who was a, 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 a actually a, a Belgian baroness, and uh, her daughter committed suicide. Then she walked in front of a car in England, which is easy to do. And died. Just look the other way. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, so I was going to write it because I feel comfortable, right? Because I worked for Vogue for 10 years and I lived in Paris and I met lots of of fancy people. So I thought, well, I'll I'll write uh, about French aristocracy, which is sort of within my grasp, I think. And so... uh, but then I thought, oh, no, I can't do another one of those books. And uh, people already think I'm so snobbish and, and <laughs> terrible. So I'll, I'll, I'll bounce. Um, I la- I'm attracted. So it's a long answer. Oh, no, please, please. But I have time. <laughs> uh, but I'm attracted to twins, and I wrote about them in Our Young Man, uh, Twin Boys. But this time I thought I'd do Twin Girls and try to show how different they can become uh, i mean because if like gay people tend to know identical twins where one is gay and the other is straight i mean that yeah. is a very frequent thing and um and you wonder how that works if they're identical yeah uh so anyway um i know girls that happened with what's strange um one straight one's lesbian the straight one, diabetes, which the lesbian one doesn't have. Lesbian one, really good at math, and the straight one isn't. Those, to me, are even weirder than just the gender or the, the sexuality side of things. All the, the Aren't men supposed to be better at math than women? Yeah, that could be it then. Yeah, that, that makes a little more sense. If they're uh, somehow correlated, the lesbian is a man, good math skills. But, yeah, yeah. But because I think, uh, I mean, there's supposed to be a difference between the male brain and the female brain. And you wonder how much that is just uh, prejudice. Yeah. Uh, but um, if there is a difference, people ascribe mathematical ability to the male brain. Anyway. That's a way of keeping women out of engineering roles. Yeah, but, right, right. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you're, you're pursuing this idea of... Uh, so anyway, I, I always liked the idea of twins. So then once I got fed up with myself for wanting to write an, uh, another book about a Baroness or something... Then I thought, well, I'll have the other sister become a saint, and then I'll use all my interests. I'm an atheist, but I'm very fascinated by Catholicism and, and spirituality. In terms know. of the, the ritual vibe no, or the no, mystic not that. thing? I, I don't know. Hey, that's what makes it mystical. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, I can read um, theological books by the hour. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yet there's no, no you know, no. I should have devoted my life to, there's none of that. Mm. Okay. I mean, I'm, a, you know, positivist uh, and I don't really believe in. Yeah. But, but I, I admire people who do, <laughs> or at least some of them. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I thought I'll have these twin sisters. And then I thought my parents are both Texans. And I lived in Texas briefly as a child, and all my relatives on both sides are Texan. So I thought, well, I know a little bit about Texas, especially in the 50s. And uh, so I thought, I'll write about Texas, and that'll surprise. And so the book is called A Saint in Texas. Hmm. And uh, anyway, I, I, in my most pessimistic moments I imagine people saying this is not an Ed White novel meaning it's not gay and uh, how much does that matter well the ones that aren't gay don't ever sell Mm -hmm. like I wrote uh, Fanny uh, and uh, Caracol those two are and gay bookstores wouldn't even handle them Hmm. they wouldn't sell them they were angry. It's a variation of the the issue I have with almost any 
artist, writer, musician, cartoonist I, I recorded who actually has a significant success. Uh -huh. Their complaint is... They get typecast. Well, it's either... Uh, all he does is write the same book or why can't he write the same book? I like the same book. Why is he doing something different? So yeah, there's yeah. a damned if you do, damned if you don't, but yeah, I mean my, uh, until I wrote, um, um, the flaneur, my, uh, my readers were a dwindling crowd of aging gay men. I mean, the, the, those are the people who show up for my reading. Yeah. Then with the flaneur, I, I, just accidentally um, plugged into the whole Paris crowd. So I suddenly had all these straight couples. I mean, whereas I would have 17 elderly gay men usually, I would have, I had 400 <laughs> uh, straight couples who were buying 10 copies at a time as stocking stuffers. Something. Why not? Not something to, to chase as far as an audience goes, but it's good to, to know that you can have a Yeah, I mean, I, I just noticed it. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I wasn't going to let that determine my next... I, I was telling a friend, I had a one tweet on Twitter that exploded and became this big viral thing, and I thought... Okay, I understand why people chase that again and again. I will never chase that again and again. There's no need to prove anything. It happened once completely by accident, um, but there's no sense of I need to make this the you know mission in life. That said, you know I'm not doing this for a living, and you're yeah, no, writing well. Kind of. Yeah, that's also talk about writing, writing life, and writing professionally. I guess you know you've you've mentioned that contemporary fiction is basically the poetry of its time. There's no, the audience for it is largely other people writing fiction. Right. Um, so the market is drastically Literary shrunk. Literary fiction. Literary fiction, yeah. Um, you were around through the entire growth and bust, I guess, of gay fiction or gay literature, as it was known. How did it change? Or what did you see as the, both the driving force and the reason for it to kind of... Well, I think initially... Uh that there weren't out gay actors or out gay politicians mm -hmm. or any other kind of spokespeople. So um, writers, for once, had a, a privileged position. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think um, it's sort of like maybe James Baldwin, black writers before... There were black comedians on TV and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, but I think that uh, for a brief period, we, for like mm, 10 years, starting in the late 70s, I think that people paid attention to gay writers, though we never sold many copies. And I think that publishers thought that we would be like black writers and we'd have a crossover readership, but we didn't. Because whereas if you're black, you still have babies, divorces, adultery, and so on, which white people can identify with, I mean, a average uh, heterosexual white people. Whereas if you're gay, you're from Mars. That was my experience with Delaney, especially as I started editing those letters of his and realized the sort of stuff you covered also in terms of active gay life and 60s, 70s, and especially the early 80s before AIDS hit. Um, for a white kid from the suburbs, yeah, that's a completely alien world. That's one of those, like, okay, that was going on. I had no idea I was, you know, sequestered out in the, uh, you know, the burbs and just coming into the city on, mm -hmm. on occasions. Um, it's a tough question, but now that we know each other, <laughs> your diagnosis. Oh, 85, I was diagnosed yeah. as being HIV positive. So I thought I'd be dead yeah. in two years. And what did that do to you? It made me pull the blankets over my head. Yeah. Like most people, writers, like Hervé Guibert, H-E-R-V-E, G-U-I-B-E-R-T, uh, was a very good friend of mine. And uh, he said, if I only have three years left to live, I'm going to write all the books I would have written if I lived to be 70, even yeah. if I have to write them badly. So he turned out like 22 books, I think. Yeah. And uh, and they're not bad at all. 
Um, you did not react the same way? I didn't. No, yeah. I just pulled the blankets over my head and didn't want to ride at all and didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll be dead. And anyway, a lot of my friends were dying, and uh, I'd gone to Paris with a, 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 a lover named John Purcell, and he died and uh, in the 80s. And everybody, seems like everybody was dying, and so I assumed I would be dead soon, too. But, um, and then, uh, I don't know, I had, uh, but then, you know, I remember Larry Kramer was very mad at me because he said, oh, here you are, positive, you're going to be dead soon, and you're writing a biovision, eh? Why aren't you writing something protesting you know, your, your own condition? And um, I thought that there was a political import to my Jeanne book because I wanted to remind people that gays had a, a history before AIDS <laughs> and that it didn't just involve disease. Yeah. I mean, that I felt like we had been medicalized and then... Yeah, you're drawn into the... Drawn into the spotlight, but only in the light of, of AIDS. Right, and and yeah. that, I mean, I felt like, gay liberation had been a fight to demedicalize ourselves and humanize ourselves, and that now we were being remedicalized. I remember, uh, uh, I did a book of short stories, which I later incorporated into, um. I can think of the French title, Le Chard. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Into one of the novels? No, a, a short story. Is a, okay. a collection of short stories. Yeah, one anyway. called Chaos. The, no, the, no, okay. not that. Well, we'll look in the, the yeah, uh, right. copy of your new book. Let's see. Um, Skinned Alive? Yes. Oh, wow. Good guess. Good guess. Very good. <laughs> um, I, um, so I... Uh, I wrote some stories. I wrote like two or three, and Adam Mars Jones, an English writer, Mars hyphen Jones, yeah. uh, wrote uh, the other two or three stories, and we brought it out as a favor, uh, paperback, original, because we th were tired of. Every I think it was one of the first pieces of AIDS fiction, and uh, we were tired of the only people talking about AIDS were doctors. And so we thought, why doesn't somebody talk about it from the inside as an experience? And so we did that book, and then I incorporated my stories into Skin to Live later, mm -hmm. but with others. Uh, but um, so, but Larry Kramer thought I should just be writing about AIDS, and uh, and they thought that was a terrible detour to write about Shanae. But I thought it. I thought Janae was one of the giants of 20th century fiction and uh, and also a, a kind of anti-hero of gay life. And, uh, and it was important to tell his story, I thought. Of, but, you know, I mean, every, and I, everybody else was writing about AIDS, but... But it had to be you, because... Yeah, right. Because Larry had his perspective. So that process of crawling out from under the blankets was simply, I'm not dead yet? Yeah, right. And, and then eventually I I realized I was a slow progressor rather than a... I mean, I wasn't a non-progressor, but I wasn't an ordinary. I I must have had... I think they say you, you had two... If you had two genes, you were a non-progressor of a <laughs> certain sort. But if you only had one, you were a slow, slow progressor. So I thought, well, my counts were sinking, but very, very slowly. And then the medications started to get developed in time? Not until 95 yeah. or something. Jeez. So this was 85. So I lived 10 years with it. But I was, a, I was born and brought up a Christian scientist, so I wouldn't take any of them. So medicine was a bad idea to begin with? Yeah. Oh. I mean, you know, in other words, thank God, because I didn't take any AZT, which mm. killed people. Oh, it's true. true. But you also can't go for hypnosis or mesmerization. I'm just kidding. It's the only other thing I know about Christian scientists. <laughs> 
apparently is a grand hatred of Mesmer. That was the, the only... Oh, um, yeah. Um, um, probably a competition. Yeah. <laughs> this is at Eddie. Uh, but no, I mean, I don't believe in it. I'm an atheist, as yeah. I say, but but I, I did have a kind of prejudice against medicine, and I think it was a useful one, uh, as it turns out, just by accident, mm -hmm. because I didn't take AZT, which did tend to kill yeah. people. And then in the process, you reconciled yourself to the same death sentence we all have, but potentially quicker. Yeah. I mean, you don't know that at the time. You're, you're looking at all this stuff in retrospect, but yeah, I just can't imagine in the moment, you know. Um, I think I felt like it, uh, it made me very, I don't know. I think I wrote uh, a parallel symphony under the spell of all yeah. the AIDS. So how's queerness changed? Has queerness changed? Yeah. Oh, it's become uh, less arty, less intellectual, less cultural, more uh, physical, more uh, gym-oriented, uh, more commercial, uh, kind of more simple-minded, I mean. Lady Gaga instead of uh, Maria Collins. <laughs> um, one of your, well, I would say fellow professors at, at Princeton, um, I know you're retired now, but Jeff Nonakawa, yeah. I hit up Jeff saying I was going to get together with you and, uh -huh. and see if he had any questions. Uh, he asked, what's the most important thing you find you've tried to teach to younger generations of gay people about sex, style, and the ways they go together? Uh, I've never taught gay people as as a gay. Yeah. I mean, in other words, uh, I, uh, I I assume that through scuttlebutt or something they know I'm gay, and then I usually mention it casually in the first three or four weeks of teaching. And but um, I never attracted gay students uh, to my creative writing classes. Mm. I don't, but my students never knew who I was, and they don't know who Toni Morrison is or George Carroll. Even even in our Google, I, I could understand that like twenty years ago when they wouldn't be able to search things quite as well. But to me, if I was a college student nowadays, I would try and do as much deep background on any professor I had. But well, you're you know, more curious and than... or paranoid, but whatever. Yeah, that's. <laughs> but uh, yeah. no, they aren't interested. In, huh. and they're interested in their own writing, and maybe they're somebody from their eating club, mm -hmm. but uh, n not grown-up people. Envious of the ease of coming out nowadays? No, Com okay. it's not so easy. Uh. I mean, first of all, like, uh, you know, uh, 72 countries in the world still have capital punishment for gays. Sure. I saw that figure yesterday. and uh, And then... Um, you know, the guy who wrote Boy Erased, I had dinner with last night. Uh, it's a new, you know, that movie, uh, uh, his name, is, anyway, it's about uh, um, conversion therapy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and a third of the uh, people in America are born again Christians. So they're, they're all against gays. I, I've had many Mormon friends. Some of whom have committed suicide uh, recently. So I mean, yeah. it's not solved. That's what I get for talking out of my ass. Okay, that's. I assumed it was easier, but you know, just because it's well, I mean, culturally uh, more like, prevalent. Like but fifty percent of college students say they're bisexual mm -hmm. now, and I don't. I think only probably five percent are gay, but um, and probably only five percent have ever tried to be gay. Uh, but um, but it's a it's a mindset yeah, yeah that's different. I heard a friend of of a uh, neighbor, a twelve year old kid, said, "Mom, I think I'm bi, but I'm not sure." And it was just like <laughs> and these are people my age, around fifty or so, and it was I don't know how to approach this, so we're just going to let our kid figure out what's going on and and yeah, we'll just go right. on from there. Oh, that's so, funny, you know. But um, how do the students change over the years then in, in that respect? Um, they were always hopeless. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you mentioned you didn't have very many students who became 
writers no. subsequently. Well, some, I think you like mentioned. Mona Simpson was one of my students, and Stephen McCauley was another one. And uh, I had a really clever one uh, who died of AIDS in the 80s who only lived to write one book, a gay book called Boys on the Rock. And um, I don't know, you know, I... Uh, and then we had the odd Jonathan Safran Four who weren't gay, but who were writers. Hmm. But otherwise, students in general. Well, I mean, uh, like uh, the Princeton students are, are too smart to be writers. They all are going to work for Goldman Sachs. You know, I mean, why would you be a writer? Or... Yeah. Yeah. Is there any degree that you um, impress upon them that this is not a way to make a living or do they come in pretty much knowing that? They know that. Okay. Because <laughs> that's one of the, gee, Gil, what have you learned from 300 of these episodes? It's generally, thank God I didn't go into a career in the arts. That's that's largely yeah, right, right. You know, my, my big lesson. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know. But did you, did you think marriage, gay marriage would be legalized in your lifetime? This is something Sandy and I talked about uh, when I recorded with him. The question, not just that gay marriage would exist, that would be legalized, but that his marriage would be on the front page of the New York Times style section on a Sunday. And he just, I, I said, well, back in 78 when you were being dropped from the, the college where you were teaching because of your gay literature, he's like, Gil, 2008, I didn't think this was going to happen. I feel guilty that we made a jump ahead of every other ghettoized group in the, the the country, but your perspective? Um, well, I mean, he was, I mean, Sandy, uh, my, as I say, one of my best friends, and I adore him in every way, but he's uh, young, he was younger than I, and richer, and more middle class. Yeah. I, I never approved of gay marriage at all. Yeah. Yeah. I don't approve of marriage. That was a Fran Lebowitz thing in, in her documentary that Scorsese did. She's like, military, marriage, why do you want those? Those are the whole thing. We're supposed to not get those because we're gay. That's that's kind of the point. But Exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I defend anyone, any guy's right to get married. I mean, why not? He should have the same liberties that anybody else has. But... But I don't think it's a good idea, Mary. Mm -hmm. Did you and Michael get hitched? We or? got married, but for a very particular I assume reason. There's a state planning and, and health coverage things that go into this also. Health, but Health coverage. Yeah. Uh, wh what it was was Princeton would cover domestic partners, if you were gay, until marriage was legalized. And then if you lived in a state where it, it was legal... You had to get married in order for the partner to still be. I just love the gay version of a shotgun wedding. It's just yeah. so great. <laughs> well, well, you know, you understand what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that it became you would have to if it was legal, so that you'd qualify for. Yeah, for because coverage. straight people had to get married. Yeah, there were no domestic partners straight. Yeah. Who were covered. See, the irony is when my wife and I got hitched in middle 2000s, she was working in the city at the time, and we live in New Jersey, and she was getting taxed on her income in the city based on our combined tax rate. And my father's ingenious idea was, you should secretly get divorced. Don't tell the family or anything, but that way if you're divorced, she will be paying less in taxes in New York. I'm like... Really not thinking about the sanctity of marriage thing at all, Pop, are you? You're, yeah, you're just, no. how do we get the financial benefit out of well, this? And, uh, clever. Yeah, yeah. He um, he figured we weren't going to have kids, therefore, you know, we may as well just secretly get divorced but pretend yeah. we were married from here on. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, there are, um, there are many stories I can go into down the line about that guy. But um, favorite place you lived over the years? You had Paris, you had Rome, you've got Chelsea. Well, I... Or is it always where you are? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a sort of outside, out of mind guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I did enjoy living in Paris. And I think it helped me. Uh, it, it gave me a different focus on my own country. And uh, it introduced me to uh, another language and... Uh, and I read every day in French, and I write emails every day in French. Mm -hmm. 
and I, uh, um, you know, I'm, half of my books are in French. Uh, and uh, I love having access to another culture. I, I actually now, if I was going to move to another city, it'd probably be Rome. Because Michael has been teaching in Rome and uh every summer and uh and so I visit him quite a bit and he's crazy about it and uh so I don't know that but I'm happy here. I don't think New York's very interesting now. Yeah. But I think it's uh it's that's, like an old shoe. That's a recurring theme among anyone who's got longevity in New York. Yeah. That is especially Manhattan. Coming from New Jersey, I, I look at this and see it like, wow, you're you're putting up malls. Congratulations. Yeah, that's right. that's really, you're getting rid of, you know, everything that we liked about New York. Uh-huh. Is there a meet cute story between you and Michael, or is it going to be something horrendously graphic that we shouldn't go into? Oh, no, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of meet cute. Uh, I, I had a French lover who died, and a year, I, a year after he died, uh, Michael sent a fan letter to me via my agent, uh, my literary agent, and she sent it on to me saying, this seems like a keeper, because it was a beautifully written letter. And he was in the Peace Corps in the Czech Republic. So I said, why don't you come to Paris? Not realizing that the bus fare would take half of his salary, <laughs> monthly salary. Yeah. And that uh, and that it would take 16 hours. But anyway, he did come, and uh, and we met on Easter 23 years ago, I guess, and uh, and uh, and I fell for him instantly, but he didn't for me for a while. But anyway, that was in January. No, that was at Easter, and then by August he had moved in with me in Paris. So I'd gone back and forth to. Uh, to Czechoslovakia several times. Yeah. Happy? Not um, just you two, but, you know, happy in general? Or are, you, uh, uh, are you the sort of person who thinks about being happy? Well, I mean, uh, now I have, I'm a bigamist. I have an, another husband yeah. who's Italian uh, and um, who's I've only known for a year. So he's, uh, he's, uh, and he, uh, is a doctor and uh, oncologist and a musician who plays the harpsichord with the Dublin Symphony and has a PhD in music and is only 41 and is gorgeous and rich. <laughs> anyway, so he, um, and he, and he sold his house in Dublin and he got rid of his partner of 17 years, whom happily I never knew. And, um, and then he's gotten this job doing uh, cancer research, and uh, and he's moving here January first. Gay men have the most complicated lives. It's you know, <laughs> it's like being friends with Delaney and just hearing all the yeah. permutations and and oddball things along with his his long time steady. But yeah, you know, but yeah, it's quite a world. Um, I think it's in City Boy, but it might be in, in the new but one. But you know, it's not oh. just gay people. Oh, I know. I, I, inter- <laughs> I interviewed the French uh, editor of French Vogue uh, for House and Gardens. I was going to talk about her apartment. And halfway through the interview, she said, Oh, Mr. Wright, I don't know why we're going on with this charade. I've left my husband for the most wonderful lover. And then she talked to the rest of the time about the lover. Well, that's the French also. That's uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. We have different uh, different sets of standards, and especially in our puritanical. Uh, yeah. But uh, I was going to say, in it's either City Boy or the, the new one, you had a line that says, uh, we seldom guess what we'll truly prize years from now. It was in terms of literature and in terms of the nostalgia looking forward that youth have. Are there books or writers that you did not get when you were young, that you had to grow into, yeah, not I, not school assigned stuff, but but yeah, you know. uh, I think, um, well, uh, Ford Max Ford, for instance, uh, is somebody I didn't much like as a young writer, but I I admire a lot now, and I 
I wrote a long piece, I guess, for the New York Review of Books for on uh, No More Parades, mm -hmm. which is a huge thing. Yeah. And um, and I don't know. I <clears throat> I was a, a friend of mine who's more or less my age wrote me the other day and said, "Do you like Henry James?" I hated him as a young man. He said, and I, now I love him. And I said, I almost have the opposite trajectory. Uh, I, I, I'm Young such passion. A, I was such a snobbish kid, <laughs> yeah. an Anglophile kid that I loved him when I was young. And I loved his subtlety and everything. And then uh, now I get impatient with it. Except I admit there are about six masterpieces, which, uh, which is enough for anybody. Well, it's another line from your one of those two books about uh, uh, prepping for God's great quiz show oh, when yeah. you were a kid and, and having to have all those canonical yeah, right. masterpieces under your belt right. so that you can show everybody else. Uh, trust me, I subscribed to that for decades before <laughs> just veering off into my own thing at this point and, and uh, realizing no one's going to ask me any of this stuff. So I, I can, you know, and as you've seen, I can fake it relatively well. So. You're very good. <laughs> um, but yeah, along those lines of, of, Books, you know, gaining esteem. Are there books of your own that you just, you look back at and, yeah, I really, you know, I nailed that. Like, I, I really pulled this off. Or do you feel that about every one of your books because you're very confident in yourself as a writer? I tend to be very confident. <laughs> Good, okay. <laughs> uh, and I sort of see my first 10 books, let's say, I wanted them to be unlike each other. So each one seemed to have a different mission and different goal to me. And so uh, I, I, they were incomparable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't be compared to each other. Yeah. Uh, that sounds... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a great way to start this off. But um, In fact, stupidly, I didn't actually get to the, the subject at the very beginning. The Unpunished Vice, uh, your latest collection... You may as well tell us, and though it comes up in the book, what the title's in reference to and how this varies in relation to the other memoirs that you've done. Well, I, uh, you know, I wrote a book about uh, New York in the 60s and 70s, and then I wrote a book about my years in Paris. Then I wrote uh, uh, um, My Lives, which was not chronological, but uh, by topic, like my psychoanalyst, my blondes, and so on. And so that's the one that kills me that I didn't read it before we got together because uh, I, I just read the my psychoanalyst this morning and oh, thought, man, I wish I'd you know because I I foolishly go around thinking there's going to be a key to people, uh, oh, yeah. even though we know it, uh, nothing's that reductionist. But I still had the oh, I bet if I had just read that uh, one, I'd, you know, oh. yeah. Well, but I mean, each one, uh, I've had a very, I think I've had a very full life, so. It, you know, like most writers uh, go to Johns Hopkins and then they teach at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And that's their life. But I, I've had a very, very life. And I, because I, luckily, because I was a journalist mm -hmm. and uh, I've met everybody and done everything. So um, I think that's part of it. And uh, But The Unpunished Vice is the title from Valerie Larbo, L-A-R-B-A-U-D, who was the supervisor in charge of the translation of Ulysses by mm -hmm. Joyce. And uh, he was a very rich man who developed lockdown syndrome and lived the last 20 years of his life totally. After having been a big playboy and uh, a wit and... Uh, uh, and a brilliant writer. Uh, he wrote Barnabooth, which was a popular French novel and uh, of the 20s. And, I mean, he really was a wonderful writer, but uh, he um, he did have this lockdown syndrome and spent 20 years of his life paralyzed in this case, uh, in the case of his body, you know, <laughs> mummy-formed body. Yeah. And... Um, but anyway, I I think I always thought that was a, first of all most people who read think it's a tremendous virtue, but I think that writers know that 
it's much easier to read than to write. And so uh, it, it is a vice. And, uh, and, and it gets out of control in many people's cases. They read too much all the time. And uh, or they read the wrong things, <laughs> but uh, so I uh, I thought that was a funny title. Mm -hmm. Talk about reading the wrong things because you mentioned at one point the um, avoiding, we'll say, airport fiction or yeah. in a particular genre fiction, and then you will accidentally quote unquote read something like a John Banville uh, yeah. book or something like that that's mystery slash thriller and discover that you're enjoying the hell out of it. Yeah. Um, not realizing in the moment that you're, what you're enjoying is in fact the genre aspects of yeah, it. Right. Does that ever overcome the wall? Does it ever get you thinking, hey, you know, I can I can slum a little and enjoy some... No, some, okay. I'm such a, a culture vulture and, and so imbued with self-improvement and, and getting ready for God's quiz show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you get back to it. Ed, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. That's great. That was fun. And that was Edmund White. His new book is The Unpunished Vice, A Life of Reading, from Bloomsbury, USA. You should read it along with any and all of Ed's other books you come across. Uh, you can find a lot more at Edmund White, which is E-D-M-U-N-D-W-H-I-T-E dot -E com. Uh, that's got a big bio uh, about him, a gallery of all his books, CV, plenty more. Um, no social media, which is for the best. But as I mentioned during our conversation um, and in the intro, I've picked up a bunch more of his books after our session so I can just keep reading him after our podcast. It's like connecting with someone who not just reads the same things you like to read, but reads the things you wish you had time to read or reads or tells you things you know you have to get to in terms of reading. Um, plus, there's the expansive life story he's got, which being a boring guy who lives in the suburbs, I can never measure up with. But still, anyway. All of that's a rarity for me, but Edmund White is a rare writer, and I'm so glad to have had him on the show. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Ed, so, who are you reading? Now, if you want to hear his answer to that, and it's a doozy, uh, maybe get some extra conversation, although that's the part where I had to cut out about 30 or 40 minutes of us sniping about different writers, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The third quarter episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Moby, Audrey Niffenegger, Mark Ulrichson, David Lloyd, Glenn David Gold, Ken Crimstein, Hal Mayforth, Lance Richardson, and Nathaniel Popkin. I'll get the next episode up pretty soon, I promise. Now you can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, ugh, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at Ed's apartment in Chelsea, where I found street parking, thankfully, uh, but also subjected myself to a really crappy lunch at Dallas Barbecue on West 23rd. Um, this was part of a double episode trip to New York, where I also recorded with Bill Cardalopoulos in Brooklyn. So there were tolls on the GW and Triborough, but street parking for both guests, so I, I made out okay. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. 
Now, music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. And you can find more of Hal's work at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. That's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with legendary photographer Deborah Feingold. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals and please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, keep the conversation going. 